Hey everybody, on today's episode of Still to be Determined, we're going to talk about nuclear powered shipping. Can this be a solution to cleaner shipping? Before we get into that, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm Matt Farrell's older brother. I'm a writer. I'll be asking him the questions. And of course, you're familiar with Matt from his YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell. Matt, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I'm okay. We had a bit of rain for the past few days, which made me live like a hermit. And then I realized <laughs> I was living like a hermit and tried to step outside and was much like our early ancestors who looked at this orb in the sky called the sun and decided <laughs> me no like and went back inside. So that's where I've been. <laughs> How about yourself? It's basically the same thing. We've had freezing rain. So stepping outside, I didn't want to fall down. So I just went right back inside. <laughs> I've been living like a hermit. Yep. So today we'll be talking about Matt's most recent episode, which was titled, Can Nuclear Powered Ships Clean Up Shipping? Question mark. This episode aired on February 1st, 2022. There were many comments on the video. And just a reminder to everybody listening, please do drop a comment below this video or in the contact information. You can find the contact information in the podcast description and you can leave comments there as well. Wanted to share a comment from our last video in which we discussed microgrids based on homeowners with battery systems. And there was this comment from Alan Tupper that mirrored some of what Matt and I had been saying about ways to entice communities to actually start building out these grids. Alan Tupper wrote, on getting the battery systems out in a roughly even spread, I wonder if a lottery giveaway system broken down by zip code would work. Each zip code could get one winner who would receive a free installation. I think that that's an interesting concept to start building out and spreading out the kind of microgrid that we were talking about last week. Yeah. And you know the utilities could afford it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> As for the most recent videos about nuclear-powered shipping, there were lots of responses which included a idea that I thought was like a piggyback idea to the concept of a nuclear powered ship pulling into a port. This one from Donald Hodick, who wrote, one added advantage to help recoup the initial cost of building a nuclear powered ship would be that when it's idle, loading or unloading at a dock, the ship's nuclear power system could be connected to the local power grid to help with the generation huh. of electrical power for the port city. Granted, there would have to be major oversight that would ensure the systems and system maintenance are performed as scheduled, as in the airline industry. I think that that was an interesting concept of kind of like mobile batteries yeah. pulling into a port. And even if it wasn't citywide, just port wide, just if your visiting ships are helping power your local port needs, that would potentially cut down on costs for the port and help benefit the region as a whole. Yeah, I mean, that's very similar to a uh, vehicle to grid and vehicle to home technology where you can plug your EV into your house and not only can you charge it, but you can do the reverse. Like the new Ford F-150 electric truck can do this where you have a power outage, you plug your truck into your house and you get power. Uh, you could use it as a storage system so that you could sell that energy back to the grid if they need it too. So it's like, it makes perfect sense where it's not moving the ship, but you could earn some a little extra money for the shipping company or the owner of the boat to sell some of that energy off to the grid or the local port or whatever it is. It's like, that's pretty smart. Yeah. I also, as I was watching the video, it was interesting because the video took the lens of logistically, how could this be done historically? What is the history of this technology looking mm -hmm. toward the future? How might this technology be plugged in? And I understand that that's, that's the window of your channel at large for all yeah. of these things. But there was this comment that I think plugged into my concerns and thoughts around security and safety. This one is from Wolfgar Openthroat. Wolfgar writes, I'm pretty pro-nuclear, but there are a number of factors that leave me skeptical about the safety and shipping applications. Properly trained reactor techs and maintenance isn't cheap, and even if those costs are overshadowed by long-term savings, shipping companies tend to be big on cutting corners to save money and cheaping mm -hmm. out everywhere they can, even when it is both ill-advised and at times explicitly illegal. There's also hazards that ships face, from breaking up in a storm at sea to accidents like collisions in harbors. Plenty of ships are lost each year. The dangers of radiation are overblown, but that is a lot of potential nuclear accidents every year. You'd basically need apocalypse-proof, idiot-proof, self-contained, zero-maintenance reactors that yeah. can survive decades under the unsupervised mercies 
of all the world's, world's undertrained lowest possible wage mariners and the ships they're being and the ship they're in being dashed against rocks and scattered along with strict regulations to ensure that reactor equipped ships have the reactor properly removed and decommissioned instead of being sold to a country with lax laws for the ship breaking. It's not as bad an idea as fission powered cars, but it's got a lot of obstacles to overcome and half of them are rooted in human greed. I <laughs> yeah. I thought that Wolfgar really painted a fairly accurate dystopic vision of the immediacy of these kinds of dangers that and I found myself thinking in terms of we recently just in the past year had the Suez Canal shut down by a ship that <laughs> wedged itself in there wedged itself in there what if there was a, a ship that did something as stupid as that ship there are cases of the XN Valdez, you had a ship that ran itself aground because of drinking on the part of the yep. crew. And yep. you think in terms of, okay, as he describes, you would need to have nuclear engineers aboard these ships and they are out at sea for extended periods of time. And then, and the amount of lax behavior aboard those ships is notorious. And then for me, one step beyond this was what would prevent a country that wants to get a hold of a nuclear reactor from putting together effectively a boat full of armed pirates, sending yep. them out to capture one of these ships. What kind of security would you need in order to basically fight off high seas piracy that would be looking for not just an opportunity to ransom off a crew, which happens, that's what modern piracy largely looks like. You come too close to a certain country bunch of people come out in small boats and take over the boat and then ransom off the crew back to the company that owns the ship. But now they'd be ransoming back potentially a nuclear reactor or potentially just taking that ship and handing it over to a country that wants the material itself. So lots of very, you know, Harrison Ford action thriller scenarios <laughs> yeah. spun out of my head as I was watching your video, which I understand that is not the focus of your channel. No. <laughs> but <laughs> yes, those, there is that interface to the world. And I just wanted to get your thoughts. Like, those are concerns of mine. Those are absolutely yeah. concerns of mine. A couple of things nuclear ships that are currently in operation, a lot of the history I went through, most of them tend to be for militaries. So, of yeah. course, you're going to have military budgets. So, you're not going to have a shortage of making sure nuclear engineers are on board, that they're properly yeah. being maintained, and all that kind of stuff, because it's a military making sure their machines are properly run. Because it's also and the piracy military, on the high seas, seas with a military, <laughs> a military operation is not going to. Yeah, I understand. Right. That. So they can defend themselves. And at the same time, there's because it's just the military, there's fewer of them, which means there's fewer accidents. So it could kind of give a false sense of security of, well, there really aren't that many nuclear accidents on the seas at all when you look at the history. But it's also because it's a very small number of ships that have been doing this over the course yeah. of history so far. So as you ramp it up into shipping, suddenly, just because there are more of them, you're going to have more accidents. And yeah. it is it is a concern. But when it comes to like the concern around policies, you can put regulations and policies in place and agreements around the world where if a company is not properly maintaining a, a ship, that they could get in like deep trouble. Like they would be they would be responsible for any catastrophe that would happen. And because of that, even though these shipping companies are very, you know, want to cut corners, they're also not going to want to put themselves in liability risks for that could bankrupt the company. So they're going to want to try to make sure things are properly maintained. So there are ways that you could try to cajole certain companies into doing it and set things up so that it could be cost prohibitive if things go wrong so that they want to, they may not want to do it if they don't think they can actually maintain it. So I don't think there's a policy issue that couldn't be figured out. But the whole piracy thing is an interesting angle because that is a problem we have today. I don't know what the answer is to that. It is something that's concerning. But somebody did comment in, that, in the video's comments about the, the amount of radioactive material for, that's in a nuclear reactor for a ship is actually very, it's not super radioactive. It's a very small amount. It's not, like he even commented about one of the fuel pellets is actually the radioactive fuel level is so low you can actually hold it in your hand and not be at risk. Mm. So it's like, this is not something as something as dangerous as like a nuclear reactor like you'd have on land it's something much more low power it is safer but yeah you don't want that to get in the wrong hands anyway so it's like the question is how do you prevent that from happening
I have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> it's a concern. Yeah. I think the regulations and policy angle is that's an understandable track to take. I question the efficiency of that or the efficacy of that simply mm-hmm. because we know from within our own lifetimes, the number of maritime accidents that have occurred and the companies yes. that have been responsible for those accidents sure. are perfectly fine. Exxon did not go out of business after the Valdez released tens of thousands of barrels of oil and they were directly responsible for it. There have been oil rigs that have failed and caught fire and released things. But there's, that, there's, a different, there's a difference there in my mind because you're talking about a government wanting to be, play a little fast and loose because they need that oil and they don't want to bankrupt the company that's giving them that oil. There's a dependency there. Here, there's not as much of a dependency. You're talking about shipping containers from China over to the United States. It might be a shipping right. company. It's a totally different relationship. And, I could, and because of the concerns around nuclear, there's already incredibly strict regulations around it already around the world. You know that governments like the United States and the European Union and China and every company, country in the world would put strict regulations around this. So it's not going to be like proliferating across shipping like rapid fire. It would probably be a very, very slow controlled rollout and very targeted use cases just because it is nuclear. I think it's interesting that this will be our episode of Crossfire because I continue to think you wouldn't have, there will always be countries that will be willing to say like, you want to be unregulated? Go ahead and be unregulated. And in fact, that yeah. was a comment from Schmuzzy Head. Yeah. Schmuzzy Head makes a very good point, despite the fact that their username is Schmuzzy Head. <laughs> Schmuzzy Head wrote, 50% of ships are registered in countries like Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. This is because it's economical. Safety standards are less comprehensive, which also saves money. It would be very easy for a ship to have an unregistered nuclear powered source and be flying a flag of a country that would say, like, all we're looking for is a little bit of a kickback. We don't need to regulate you. And then that ship going in and out of ports without anybody in those host countries, the United States, China, you mentioned all those countries that would be very concerned about these things. I think that the maritime laws are notoriously uneven. And Mm -hmm. I think that there would be a lot of potential for there to be safe ports, safe harbors, pun not intended, but embraced. But but I come back to, again, the nuclear proliferation thing. In the United States, there are companies that make nuclear reactors, make these kind of things. The regulations of the laws prevent them from doing business with certain countries. Mm -hmm. So if that was the case, you could prevent them from selling nuclear powered sh- nuclear reactors that are used in ships to those kind of countries that, where they might be registered. It's like there are different things you could do to try to prevent that from happening. Wouldn't be perfect, but it would help to cut back on that. It's like that's where I keep leaning in. There are ways you could do policies and lean into the existing nuclear policies that try to prevent proliferation mm. that can try to c- keep it somewhat under control. But it's also, you know, Pandora's box. Once it's <laughs> once it's yeah, out once there, these are out on the open uh, seas, it would be yeah. they're out on the open seas. Yeah. In trying to compare some apples and oranges here, you in this video compared the diesel operation to a potential nuclear powered ship. How do those match up with some of the other power sources that you talked about in other videos? Solar, wind. Would right. it be if a company was looking in a five to 10 year window of having one of those alternative sources aboard a ship, which one would they pick today? And if you were to speculate in 50 years, which one would probably be the one that they would pick in 50 years? Mm. So Pandora's box, Pandora's put back on the shelf and now it's the magic eight ball. If you're just talking money, I have a feeling nuclear is not going to catch on as a mainstream solution because of these other options that are available. You can easily retrofit existing ships to have the wind power sources that help to cut fuel use today. That's going to be readily available. It's cheaper to implement. You're going to start seeing savings right away. Existing infrastructure, yada, yada, yada. Best path forward for companies. That's probably where they're going to go before they go to nuclear. It's similar to the case for why utilities want to build out wind turbine farms and solar farms over building a new nuclear power reactor because it's more expensive to build a nuclear power reactor. The levelized cost of energy is a little higher. So it's like they're going to go where it's cheaper. And even for nuclear powered ships, even though it's better than diesel over the life of the ship, 
it's still not as good as just taking a diesel ship and retrofitting it or going to hybrid fuels that are like biofuels and stuff like that that are lower in co2 combined with wind or solar it's like it's there's so many different paths you can take to get to a cheaper solution that produces less co2 so it's a win for the environment it's a win for the the pocketbook of the company and you don't have to worry about the proliferation in the pandora's box opening of oh my god nuclear so i do think it's going to happen i think we're going to see more and more of these ships showing up because it will make sense for certain use cases especially for ships that may have to go out to sea for months on end and they don't have to worry about going to port to fuel up it's going to make sense but for i think for shipping container ships i think it's going to be more likely we'll see renewable energy sources biofuels and stuff like that being added in and the end result being an improvement of shipping even if nothing happens in shipping you point out in your video that we're responsible for less than three percent of the it's overall greenhouse gas issue mm -hmm. so putting to the side will we have a nuclear powered ship or a solar or a wind powered ship out on the high seas putting that to the side is any of the technology that you talked about you talked about it's the molten salt reactors this is something that you've mentioned before people in your comments are pushing this as something for domestic use for mm -hmm. power creation for cities Yep. Where would the application be best used in order to have a bigger impact for greenhouse gas emissions? It would be for land energy use. It would mm -hmm. be like powering a city off a molten salt reactor is going to have a much bigger impact on the environment than making a nuclear ship. It's diminishing returns when you start to go to that path. I'm definitely in the mindset of we have to address all of it. Like wherever we're burning fossil fuels, we have to figure out solutions to get away from that. For right. climate change but if you want to just optimize things and get where the biggest bang for the buck is it's obviously cars trucks you know transportation is the biggest one mm -hmm. then generating clean energy for cities it's like that's probably the next biggest one so it's like that's where the bigger bang for the buck is going to come with molten salt reactors small modular reactors things like that so right if nuclear is still going to catch on there it's like <laughs> there's a lot of people that are pro nuclear that like just go nuclear and it's yeah, but money is where I keep coming right. back to. It's like, I don't disagree that nuclear is a great base power source, but it's still very expensive considering other technologies that are out there. It also has probably the worst PR. It's unjustified. It's kind of like the same thing right. where people are afraid of flying, but you're more likely to die in a car accident than you are on a plane. Mm -hmm. The same thing for nuclear. It's like nuclear is actually very safe. It's incredibly safe. And when you look at the number of deaths caused by all the different energy sources, from like coal causing pollution, causing, you know, lung disease and all that kind of stuff. The number of deaths from coal, oil, all the way down to nuclear. Nuclear is one of the safest things that you can do. Obviously, right. wind and solar are actually safer because nobody dies from a panel going bad. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those, it, it's the, but it's down there right with them. It's like, well, it's I, a very yeah. small number. I could imagine that somewhere there's been a pilot who's flying and the sun hits a solar panel at exactly the right angle, hits him in the <laughs> eyes. He's like, oh my God. And then, then the, he goes down in a, in a ball of fire and we can't discount that. That's, that's a real, <laughs> real danger out there. So let's keep an eye out for that. <laughs> so listeners, what do you think about all of this? Would you support there being nuclear powered ships out on the high seas or do you see the security concerns? as being paramount let us know in the comments you can find the contact information in the podcast notes or on youtube you can just scroll beneath our lovely faces we're the two bald guys on screen right now and you can leave a comment there if you'd like to support the show please do consider reviewing us on apple google spotify wherever you listen and if you'd like to more directly support us you can go to still tbd.fm and you'll see the become a supporter button there you can throw a quarter at my head or you can just click the join button on YouTube and become a member there. All that really does help the show. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time.